We're going to begin the last portion of our day, uh, which I frankly think is going to be one of the most interesting pieces of the day. We have four panelists here who are going to help us talk about social solutions to the diabetes epidemic. Um, some of them you have heard previously, and they'll take maybe a few minutes to sort of reprise um, what their main points are, and then we have a, a couple of panelists who are new. Um, so Shireen Arendt from the ADA, Dr. Albright from the CDC, you've heard from earlier. We're also happy to have Margot Wu-Tan with, uh, she's the Director of Nutrition Policy at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Um, and she speaks and writes widely on these issues. So you may be familiar with her work. And Arlene Stevenson, who's Chief of Staff here at the American Public Health Association. Um, again, we are collaborating with them in presenting this program, so we're very happy to have Arlene Stevenson with us. And she's also a statistician, so she has my undying awe and admiration. <laughs> As a journalist, I, I really appreciate that. Um, so again, each panelist is going to make a short presentation. Some will be shorter than others because, again, you, you may have already heard them. And we're going to start with Margot Wutan. Well, I haven't heard much about what you all have been talking about through the day, but um, I'm going to talk about nutrition and obesity policy. Um, that's what we do. I'm sure you've heard a lot during the day about how 90 to 95 percent of diabetes is type 2 and that what people eat, um, whether or not they're physically active and their weight has a big influence over whether or not they end up with diabetes or pre-diabetes. I think one of the estimates I saw from Harvard said that about 50 to 80 percent of diabetes is associated with unhealthy eating patterns and with sedentary lifestyles. So at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, we work on policies and environmental changes to try to change the food environment mostly. We do some work on physical activity, but I mostly talk about food. Um, we try to change the food environment in ways that make it easier for people to eat well. So one of the things that we've been working on a lot is school food. Since kids eat about a third to a half of their calories during the school day, and schools are feeding kids quite a bit. Breakfast, lunch, oftentimes after school snack, snack during the school day. So on school lunch, there's been a lot happening. Last year in December, Congress passed and the President signed the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Every five years or so, Congress has to reauthorize the child nutrition program. So some require um, authorization and you know they have to actually extend the date of the program but while they reauthorize the program they usually take a very close look at school lunch school breakfast and all the child nutrition programs look to see what's working what isn't and make improvements this reauthorization was one of the most historic I've been in DC for almost 20 years and they really made the biggest changes to the programs and a number of key improvements. Um, out of that and out of work that the agencies have been doing, the US Department of Agriculture proposed new standards for school lunch and school breakfast, which are really um, a big step ahead of where many schools are today. So what they proposed was to set maximum calorie targets. So in addition to addressing hunger, the calorie standards will also be addressing obesity. They increased fruits and vegetables. They actually doubled the amount of fruits and vegetables that will be required. And you may have heard about the controversy of limiting potatoes and other starchy vegetables, which is probably one of the tiniest parts of the rule, but one that's gotten a lot of press coverage because of the politics involved and senators and representatives from potato growing states pushing back, uh, uh, saying that two servings of French fries a week in schools with school lunch is not enough. Um, the grains would need to be whole grain rich, all the milk would need to be low in fat, and there would be standards for sodium to try to keep the amount of sodium in school lunch 
um, reasonable. So USDA's proposed regulations, there are about 132,000 comments. I know at least 130,000 of them are fully and totally in support of what USDA proposed. There's some pushback on different aspects of the rule, like potatoes from the potato growers and the french fry manufacturers, some from food service directors who are concerned about the costs and about the sodium limits and from some from food manufacturers, especially those who do a lot of food production for schools. So once this, once USDA finalizes the regulations, which should be in early 2012, schools will have just a little time to put them in place. So the new school lunch and breakfast standard should be in place by the next school year, the school year beginning in 2012. So it'll mean a lot of changes. Some schools are doing a better job in improving the nutritional quality of school lunches and breakfasts, but still the overwhelming majority of schools have a long way to go to meet these standards. So there'll be a lot of work to do to help schools with model recipes, model menus, technical assistance to meet the new standards. Another key part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which, which was signed into law at the end of last year, is related to the foods that are sold outside the meal programs. So schools sell a lot of food through vending machines, the a la carte in the cafeteria, school stores, and fundraisers. And we worked with Senator Harkin and Representative Woolsey to pass a bill that had been, we'd been working it as a standalone bill for almost a decade, but it was incorporated into the reauthorization. And that provision requires USDA to develop nutrition standards for all the foods that are sold through these venues outside of the meal programs on the whole campus for the whole day. So it'll mean no more soda, candy bars, and other junk being sold out of vending machines, school stores. It'll also limit what's sold through fundraisers, where that's probably the thing that's newest that um, has gotten a little more attention is there. The, it won't limit the fundraisers kids can do out in the community, but it will limit sales of pizza and candy bars and other junk on the campus during the school day. Now, as states and cities have had good luck in changing what's in schools, they've also looked, started to look on their own, at their own programs and their own cafeterias and vending machines. And a number of cities and states have adopted nutrition standards for the foods that they sell through their concessions or through their cafeterias, through their vending machines, or that they provide through programs. The most comprehensive policy is in New York City, but even states like Alabama and Mississippi have set nutrition standards for vending machines on state property. The way that states and cities have gone about it have varied. Some have started with you know, just vending machines or just concessions or just what's in their prisons or childcare centers. Others have um, done it more comprehensively. So like in Delaware, they started with vending machines in their state parks, where New York City took a more comprehensive approach. In Massachusetts, they started with all the food that they're providing through programs, like through prisons and childcare centers and any other programs, um, homeless shelters, women's shelters, and, and other places where they're feeding folks. Um, these policies are important because State and local governments are working on obesity, and this is an important part of having a comprehensive nutrition and obesity policy. Also, it affects the diets of lots of people. 17 million people work for state and local governments, and many more eat in the cafeterias or stop and get something out of the vending machine at the Department of Motor Vehicles when they go to renew their license. And so it can have a big impact on the diets of a lot of people. Um, so I think the other thing that this can do is it can also have an influence on the way the food industry is making their products, that um, it gives an incentive for companies to reformulate if a big purchaser like New York City or LA County is setting nutrition standards for, for what they're providing. Um, another big um, step in nutrition policy that passed last year was the, as a part of healthcare reform, we passed a provision to require 
calorie and other nutrition labeling at chain restaurants across the country. So any restaurant or similar retail food establishment, a deli, a pretzel stand, any kind of um, a supermarket, anyone that sells food that's ready to eat, like restaurant type foods, has to provide calorie information right on the menu, menu board, or food display tags. So like the tags you see next to pastries at Starbucks or the tags you see next to each donut in Dunkin' Donuts. This um, requirement is important because people are eating out a lot. People now spend about half of their food dollars on away from home foods. They get about a third of their calories from eating out. And eating out has just become a way of life. And unfortunately, the way restaurants prepare foods doesn't reflect the way we eat out today. Still, a lot of people think of eating out as a big splurge when really it's just Tuesday lunch or it's you know picking up some carryout on the way home from work. And so eating out is problematic. The portion sizes are big. The calorie contents are high. Studies show that people who eat out more often don't eat as well. They eat more calories, more saturated fat, more fewer fruits and vegetables. And generally, if you look at people's diets, when they're eating at home, they're better than their diets when they're eating out. So in addition to requiring nutrition information disclosure at restaurants to help people eat better, we've also been urging the restaurants to reformulate their products to make them better, to add newer menu items that are more helpful, to add more fruits and vegetables, to increase whole grains. With calorie labeling in New York City and other places that have passed it, we have seen a number of chains improve their menus. Calories have gone down. Um, you had Kosi for lunch, right? The typical sandwich at, um, typical salad, their signature salad at Kosi used to have about 800 calories. Now it's down to about 400 calories because they had never analyzed their calorie contents before and they were surprised how many calories they were sticking into this supposedly healthy item. And so lots of restaurants around the country have been reformulating as California and New York City, Seattle, King County, and others have put menu labeling in place. So with, um, we've been encouraging restaurants to do more of that. We've especially been encouraging them to improve the nutritional quality of what's on the children's menu. That in the U.S. today, kids' meals have become synonymous with unhealthy foods. That usually, if you you know look at the kids' menu, it's much worse than the adult menu. It's mostly hamburgers, cheeseburgers, pizza, macaroni and cheese. It comes with a side of fries, and usually a soft drink. And kids are growing, developing, they're forming eating habits. Kids' food should be the best foods. They should be the most nutritious food. So we've been urging restaurants to improve the nutritional quality of their offerings, meeting with them, talking with them, um, doing studies of what they're offering. We've also been um, passing some policies in Santa Clara County and in San Francisco, they passed laws that require, that set nutrition standards for which kids' meals can come with toys as a way to encourage restaurants to reformulate their children's menus and make them more healthful. Um, since you know, we and others have been focusing on this, a number of restaurants have been making changes. The National Restaurant Association recently launched a program called Kids Live Well, and each restaurant that belongs to that has to have at least one healthier item on the menu. Darden, you may have heard just last week, made an announcement about healthier kids options in their restaurants. With the, they made an announcement last week with the First Lady. McDonald's has changed the default option in their kids' meals in the Happy Meals to cut the size of the french fry in half and to add apple slices. So we're seeing some movement on kids' restaurant meals, but they're still the overwhelming majority of choices are unhealthy and we'll continue to work with restaurants to encourage them to do better. The last thing I'll talk about quickly is food marketing to kids. Um, food marketing has a big effect on children's eating habits. 
Studies show that marketing affects what kids want to eat, what they're willing to eat, and what they do eat, and link um, food marketing with childhood obesity. Now, the industry of late has been very aggressively lobbying against some model voluntary food marketing standards, and they've been saying that food marketing doesn't work. But, of course, they know food marketing works or else they wouldn't spend $2 billion a year on it. So, um, so that argument doesn't, I think, play very well. Food marketing in this country is almost exclusively addressed through self-regulation. There are very few laws and regulations on the books that limit food marketing to kids. The, there are about 17 companies that have joined a self-regulatory program through the Council of Better Business Bureaus called the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative. And companies that belong to that initiative have agreed to limit the marketing of unhealthy foods. But from the time this program has went into effect till now, its impact has been very modest. It has had a positive impact on food marketing to kids. So that's a good sign. It gives me some hope that maybe self-regulation can work someday. But if you look at from before self-regulation went into effect till after, you see that the percent of food ads that are for unhealthy food on Nickelodeon went from 90% of ads to 80% of ads. So that's good. It's going down from you know 90% to 80% of the food ads are for unhealthy foods. But given that 75% of marketing is covered by the self-regulatory program, it's certainly not a big success, and the companies still have a lot to do. One problem is that the company's nutrition standards are very weak. They consider cookie crisp cereal and Kool-Aid and popsicles and other unhealthy foods to be okay to market to kids. And so in order to give them a better model for food marketing, we worked on a bill with Senator Harkin, which requires some of the big agencies that have expertise in this area, the Centers for Disease Control, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Federal Trade Commission to work together to develop model voluntary standards for food marketing to kids. Um, I've been surprised at the industry's reaction to these voluntary standards. These standards are purely voluntary. The FTC actually lacks the authority to implement these through industry-wide regulation. Congress took FTC's authority away in 1980, and yet the industry has been very aggressively lobbying against these voluntary standards. They've been flying in CEOs to meet with the White House. They've gotten you know, 150 members of Congress to write to the administration in opposition. They've published several bogus studies showing how this is going to kill jobs and kill the economy and hurt agriculture and you know the whole world apparently is going to come crashing down around us if these voluntary standards are released. And so their arguments are pretty ridiculous but they've been very aggressive and their political influence is significant and so we're hoping the agencies will stay strong and come out with these standards in the next month or so. So with that, I will just point you to our website. Um, the policy section of our website is at cspinet.org slash nutrition policy. And there's lots of information about school foods, um, menu labeling, kids marketing, and many other policies that we work on, um, reducing sodium and saturated and trans fat in foods and, um, and a host of other resources. So with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Dr. Albrecht, you want to go next? That's, if we want to go in order, that's fine. I'll just okay. click here, and we're going to jump around a tab. So we'll hopefully keep it interesting. We'll, we'll jump around here. Um, I should be humming.
for technical assistance, um, both in planning, it can be slow, and helping coordinate with all of our speakers, and turn it'll come on and, and, and taking care of this okay. today. It just takes a little bit. This is fine. Oh, yeah. I see. It's thank you. There we go. <laughs> Um, I wanted to start with this slide just again to try to maybe tie up some things that we've talked about and heard about through the day to try to put it in context as we hit um, policy or continue to hit policy. Um, you certainly heard from our colleagues at NIH about some of the basic science discoveries that are going on. Um, I, I certainly had the opportunity to talk and certainly about some of what we call efficacy trials. This is trials where you're going to prove something can work or not. The example of the diabetes prevention program, that's an efficacy trial. And then we move to the next level and those are, are really effectiveness studies. Those are real world. So, um, when you heard about the study in one site, a YMCA site, that would be an, a real world study. Okay, we proved that you can prevent or postpone type 2 diabetes, but can you do it in the real world? Can you do it outside of a traditional research setting? Now we get to the upper three steps, and, and we sort of share that step. NIH and CDC share that, that effectiveness, real world part of the stairway. Then you get into the efficiency, availability, and distribution. This is where we're going to try to get it in people's hands. And this is really where policy has a big role to play. And so I wanted to just kind of paint that as, as the context to think about these things because they're all necessary, but it's not enough for us to make those discoveries, to test it in the real world. If we don't get it out and distributed and scaled and, and given out to enough people, it is a tremendous disservice to the, um, to the investment that we've made in the research that we've done. So I hope that kind of helps people think about how critical it is for us to, to move uh, out from just the, the research. I put this up earlier just to remind all of us as well, a lot of these things do have to be thought about in context. There are things around, you already heard from our first speaker about nutrition labeling, menu labeling. People have to make the decision to use that information. Now there's also things around trans fat, there are things around changing the built environment so that people don't have to think about what they're doing, it is the default. And so there are a number of strategies and a number of approaches to take. They, they, many of them have merit, they certainly need to be examined and that's one of the last things that I'll comment on is there are a number of ideas, it's a question of sort of where they stand on kind of the evidence scale at this point in time. And then I put this one back up again because I really now want to draw your attention to this piece along the bottom which I really didn't talk about earlier. There are things and, and certainly from a policy perspective that we'd like to see for the total population and you know what? We hope that some of those things, if, we, if they can be lower level, they may be incredibly cheap, they're, they're given access to the entire population, it may be a default again where something is put in the foods, for example, niacin or something is done fortifying foods. People don't have to think about that. It's in the supply or not in the supply. So some of it can be put in, some things can be removed. That's, that we hope for some people may be enough for them to keep them at low risk. Hopefully the lower risk you are, the fewer things and maybe some more of these broad based policies that impact millions and millions of people but they may be at a, at a lower intensity. That's what we would hope for the whole population. But as you tend to move along the continuum here into prediabetes, diabetes and those with complications, we are incredibly optimistic, and I'll tell you about a study we're doing to, to try to get a better handle on this. We hope some of these general population strategies that are applicable to everybody will support these people as they move down the continuum. But at this point, the evidence that we have, we do have to look at some things that have been specifically studied in these populations. So when you make claims about something preventing diabetes, we would really ask, where's the evidence that you've actually shown you're preventing new cases of diabetes? And so I think we, it, it doesn't mean that, that the other things for the general population aren't important, they aren't necessary, they won't support or contribute. It's just a question of we don't really know how much of a contributor they are or how much of those is necessary to actually achieve a result of preventing diabetes or preventing complications. So the way we really look at them, and as I describe what CDC is doing, we consider these to be complementary. So for example, today, we just announced the funding for community transformation grants. These are resources that do come out of the federal government and they do come from the Prevention and Public Health Fund and those grants have been announced and the focus of them is tobacco cessation, it's obesity prevention, and it's blood pressure control. Those are the required areas in those grants. The other areas that you may work in 
could be to support diabetes prevention or to support diabetes management, but that's not a required area in those grants. Hopefully some of the things in changing the environment for obesity will provide a supportive role. We will see how these things complement each other. But I think it's important to think of these sort of as this visual gives, gives you the sense of these are complementary strategies. And so it's important for us to, again, choose wisely and pick the best out of that whole continuum of strategies that will let us work along that continuum from low to no risk all the way up to those with complications from a diabetes perspective. So I did want to mention um, a study that we are doing because this is one of the things at CDC we really are trying to do and get a handle on. We have a study called NEXTD. And the reason we've chosen that acronym, you know, if you've heard about these studies long enough, you know we just have to come up with some sort of spiffy acronym for them. Um, this is really what we consider to be natural experiments. So there are policies that have been put in place. Some of them have come out of the Affordable Care Act. Some of them we hope to add a couple more as we go forward that are much more community oriented. Some of these policies that may include the menu labeling, some of the other kinds of environmental changes that are going on. But we have now put together a network network of investigators to actually begin to study the impact of these policies in their native or natural environment. And this is really the deal with policy. They're certainly hopefully put in place because there's enough evidence and enough political will and enough other things that are necessary for getting these policies in place. But then we also have to evaluate them once they're in place. Did they have the intended impact? Did they have unintentional consequences? What have we been able to learn from those that's going to actually allow us to do a better job with putting effective policies in place? So I just wanted to give you a sense of what Next D is trying to do. It is really looking at reducing diabetes impact on an array of policies that promote healthy behaviors and improve access to quality of care. Um, that study is in its first year. Year. And so stay tuned. There will be more uh, results coming out of that. It's a five-year uh, grant. We're looking at diverse policies, as I said, everything from health plans, employers, communities. And uh, we're really looking at the, the innovations, everything from food pricing, uh, again, all those kinds of things that we'd like to be able to examine. This just gives you a sense of, um, again, needing this kind of multi-center, multi-structured kind of an intervention because just doing them one-off isn't going to help us. And then I just wanted to give you a sense of the kinds of things that um, people are looking at. One group is looking at the impact of employer-mandated high deductible plans. What happens when people are mandated by their employer to be in a high deductible plan? What does that, in the case of diabetes, which is what these are focused on, what does that do to their diabetes care and their outcomes? What about if you have a, a health plan who's um, using, again, a community-based diabetes prevention program? This is actually another investigation of the work that we're doing in the National Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, what about employer-based uh, detection and outreach? And again, we've talked about GDM. What happens with po policies around postpartum screening? What happens with those? Use of electronic medical records. Those also pose a number of questions. Um, how, able, how effective are we to use those in decision support? And then finally, the effectiveness of a health plan that is specifically designed to reduce out-of-pocket expenses. And we have room to add a couple more studies in the future, and we really are specifically holding those to take a look at some of these community-based policies. So let me just close by a couple of things related to when we think about diabetes care, at least the way I oftentimes look at this is they sort of fall into three buckets, medical management, self-management, and ongoing support. And so I want to just touch on some policies that we're working on that touch in those areas. Uh, we are looking at three policies right now to look at reimbursement and support for diabetes self-management training and chronic disease self-management. These are actually very well-proven interventions. Think about the stair step again. What about efficiency, distribution, and wide-scale implementation? We, we're, we're dogging it on those upper three stairs here. So here we're sitting on top of this excellent intervention, and where are we with actually getting them more pol? And that's where, again, policies, what is the reimbursement for these? How do we expand the utilization of proven entities like community health workers, expanding the role of allied health professionals in medication management. We've got a really strong body of evidence that these are effective. And so we really do want to look at some policy levers that will help us get these scaled and, and sustained. So those are really three that are certainly our state diabetes prevention and control programs. And again, 
We work in the executive part of the government, so we're not the legislative body. Um, so we aren't the ones setting those policies. What we are doing is contributing the science to the formulation of those policies, we hope, and that we are executing on policies and trying to really expand the utilization of those once they're in place. So that's why we're so happy to have other speakers on the panel who can do much more of that advocacy lobbying work than, than we can do. I'm gonna just remind you of, you've seen this earlier, this is the DPP, again, lots of evidence here. I wanted to put up a little bit of cost information for you so that you, know, you realize as you're making the, the argument, if you will, for implementing various policies, you certainly do need to look at the cost effectiveness because we can have some great ideas, but in order to implement it to a large portion of the population, it's just not financially feasible. So while that may not always be the driver, it has to be something that you do consider. So I want you to just to get a flavor of some of these pieces from the DPP. If you look at giving folks 100 of these people, ultimately you're going to avoid about $91,000 in health care costs. And it's not only from the new cases that you'll prevent, but it's also because people will take fewer blood pressure meds and fewer cholesterol meds. And all of those things are going to make a difference in, in coming up with a cost-effective argument. And so and if you look at delivering this intervention one-on-one, -on -one, it costs about um, $1,400 a year to deliver that intervention. So that's not a cheap intervention. But again, think about that circular diagram and that continuum along the bottom. We wouldn't want to try to implement this in the general population. So as we're implementing this national program, many people will say, well, if it works for people at high risk for diabetes, why don't we give it to all overweight or obese people? Well, not all overweight or obese people will develop diabetes. They may be able to benefit from things, again, lower on the continuum or earlier on the continuum, and they may not need this sort of intervention. So decisions about policies and decisions about interventions do have to consider how do you deploy those interventions in a cost-effective way so that you can actually have the outcomes that you need. So as a point of example, about $1,400 a year, this was done one-on-one -on -one counseling, um, again, more expensive done by highly credentialed uh, healthcare professionals. Now we look at some of those translation studies that you heard about. There have been more than the one just done with the Y. So here are a couple of examples. The Y was done for about $275 to $325 per person per year. If you look at one done in Montana with certified diabetes educators, about $500, $550 a year. When you take uh, some further work that we've done and you really look at doing this, that, like what we're doing in the National Diabetes Prevention Program, when you look at it all in all, it's going to be about $500 a person per year because that includes um, resources to engage patients, enrollment, managing the data, and those kinds of things. So not a bad uh, change and, and, again, makes a much stronger argument for policy changes when you've moved from $1,400 a person per year to $500. And that does really make a difference as we're trying to expand these kinds of things and determine who is the best target for them. So this is the program. I told you I was going to give you a little bit more information about it. But let me really just um, close by saying these are the four components to it. And each of these was thoughtfully constructed because each of them are necessary and each does have a policy component to them. Because if you look at the first one, you've got to train the workforce. And so we've got to be sure that there's the ability to provide a wide array of people access to training, not only healthcare professionals. So not unlike Shireen's comments earlier about school personnel and other non-medical professionals being trained within their ability to do these things. They're not prescribing medication for these people. Um, it is really teaching them to deliver a lifestyle program. The second lever around program quality, many of the payers will not reimburse for a program unless there is an entity in place to assure quality, and CDC is serving that role. And then as far as intervention sites, this has been a big one for policy. We have initiated a number of sites. This program is now available in uh, 43 cities in 34 states um, serving over uh, 3,000 people now. And so as that continues to grow, we certainly don't expect this to be a government-funded only program. In fact, the community transformation grants that were released today, they will not be able to provide direct service to these people. They may be able to do some other things to support these interventions, but they can't actually pay to deliver the intervention. So our model has always been help the government to invest in the infrastructure so we're helping train, we're helping assure quality, we're getting programs off the ground, and we now already have third-party payers who've agreed to come on and reimburse the program long term. So United Health Group stepped up first. We've got Medica. We've got three more that are coming on within the next 
next few months, who I have to wait to announce those until they publicly come out. So those kinds of reimbursement policies are critical for getting to those upper three stairs on that staircase. And finally, PR and marketing. You've got to be sure that you've got the ability to help draw people in and refer them so their healthcare system has to, again, provide it as a benefit, but it also has to be them understanding the reasons and rationale for coming. So let me close with that again. I think from a perspective of policy, in the public health world, they really do get to embrace the obesity policies that you've heard about, looking at some of these things that are going to make the healthy choice the easier choice, changing the built environment. And those kinds of policies and strategies get to complement these that move into the community and try to offer programs in the community and then move into the clinical sector and offer better care and outcomes. So it's really addressing that whole continuum of policy from sort of general population to more specialized subsets of the population. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, so first I have a request, which is that I'm not going to use my 10 minutes. This is the first time in my life that I haven't gone over. If you can send a note to my family and colleagues and verify <laughs> that this happened, this would be very... No one would believe you. Um, but, but really, most of my, my entire presentation was on social solutions. So I, I just sort of want to say a, a couple of, of comments that, that sort of come to mind as I listen to, my, to, to the other sp speakers here. I mean, first, that um, to take a step back, as we did um, in the American Diabetes Association a few years ago, um, and we said, what does the population think about diabetes? What, what a, folks think? Is it the touch of sugar that, that someone has? And what we found was that people didn't take it seriously. And um, the CEO of the American Diabetes Association talks about a focus group in which um, someone was said, you know, how, how serious is cancer, 999? How serious is diabetes? Much lower numbers. And one person who gave it a lower number said, you know, it's really not so bad ever since, you know, the amputation. My brother's doing fine. And you know, not even the connection. And that seems like an outlier, but but I think that the word in terms of what drives these social solutions is the understanding that diabetes is really serious. It's a serious disease that has the great beacon that we have great scientists like Anne um, who are telling us what to do about it, and great policymakers um, like Margot who are who are have actually found things that can make a difference. So we can, as a country, sit around and say we have 105 million people with diabetes and prediabetes, but we don't have the time or energy to get to it. But that's not a solution that's going to work. I mean, it's not going to work. It's not going to save us money. It's certainly not going to save our pain and our limbs. And I just feel, as I listen to the other speakers, just so fortunate that I can work in an area in which we can collaborate with Center for Science and the Public Interest and really talk about and work with, with you on how to make lives, e lives better upstream and this sort of whole world and whole society understanding of what the way we're living is doing to our kids and, and get to work um, with, with Anne and with um, NIDDK in which I can feel very confident that when we say to Congress, we need more money to tackle the disease, we're not just saying, put money in because money is a good thing to put in. We have these, these results and um, the, the way that the federal government has put together to, to explain what we've been able to accomplish. And it comes from the things we've heard from NIDDK today, the things that we've heard from CDC, that storybook you might remember that talks about what's happened in the special diabetes program. So it's really good to know that when you have a very bad problem, which diabetes is, that there is a good way for us to use our resources, both financial and time-wise, to make a real difference so that those kids aren't going to face a life that one in three of them or one in two um, live with diabetes. Because it's a serious disease, but we can do something. So my thanks to the panel members who are doing that. That was under 10, right? <laughs> Afternoon. Getting towards wrapping up our day. Uh, as I started 
prepare for this um, a few days ago, I started thinking about the social model and um, social solutions and how they're, they're really different from where we started in uh, diabetes care and treatment. We started with a medical model, which re really was almost exclusively a treatment model. And over the years, we moved into a prevention model, which helped us either prevent the disease or at least prevent the complications of the disease. And now we kind of have a new opportunity, and that is another transition that's, you know, very closely related to prevention, but it's moving into a social model. And I think it's a really good potential uh, for some creating some change, not only for people with diabetes, but also for those who are at risk or those who are, are in the pre-diabetes stage. And, of course, as I would say, being the person from APHA, it's a perfect match for a public health model. Um, social marketing really uses the application of commercial marketing. and We spoke about this a little bit before and how effective uh, that is, particularly in influencing children. Um, but the intention really is to influence a voluntary behavior in a target audience. And um, it really works to help you understand consumer preferences and consumer behaviors and the barriers that go along with those. Um, a social approach is really formation of groups of individuals who are interested in the topic. And it can be as simple as something like a group of neighbors or ladies who all go to the same hairdresser um, up to something that's much more formal and structured that involves, you know, businesses and universities and the neighborhoods. Um, it takes a step back from the old sort of paternalistic approach of the medical model and uh, gives the power back to the individual. Um, it gives them the ability to be self-empowered. And that's really exciting. Um, there aren't many things in lives, uh, in our <coughs> lives, where we can you know, really take back the power and uh, do things for ourselves. So why is a social model important? Well, first of all, I think it has the potential to be cost-effective. Um, also, many individuals would rather have a discussion with and learn from a group of their peers than they would sit down with a medical professional to have that conversation. Um, I think it has the potential to build self-confidence and to give hope, which because the um, many of our minority groups are more impacted by this disease, you know, a sense of hope is something they need in many aspects of their lives. Um, I also believe it gives us the ability to a work on the issue of the readiness to deal with the disease. Um, Dr. Albright talked about, you know, you have the information, but what do you do with it? Well, you need to be ready to use it. Uh, maybe we can learn from our colleagues in the substance abuse field who have worked for years on the readiness issue, you know, you know the readiness to, to go into treatment so that it actually works for you. The, um, these groups actually, you know, share goals, they share successes, failures, uh, and something even simple like just sharing recipes. Um, the small things uh, can often be a big hurdle for people. Um, in these groups, you might meet someone who could help provide transportation to the doctor for you, which you didn't have before. Someone who could help you in picking up your diabetes supplies at the pharmacy, which for you before was a challenge. Um, in fact, we might even learn from it. Uh, it might teach us that self-monitoring of blood sugar is good for one group, but family support is good for another group, something that we need to know. Um, in southeast Chicago, they actually formed what I call a more formal model of social, um, social solution, and that is they put together uh, the universities and businesses and some neighborhoods in min minority communities, and they built uh, community capacity. They did you know, training and consciousness raising and got people ready uh, for action. They tried to level the playing field. They met in libraries. They gave flu shots. They did foot exams. They did um, different group exercises so that people got to know each other and, and knew each other on a personal level. And um, sometimes they even brought in experts uh, as speakers when they needed to do that. So, um, you know, the results of this are still playing itself, itself out, but it, it sounds like a really good model. It takes a lot of planning, takes a lot of organization, uh, but it certainly has potential. 
Um, you don't have to be organized. It can be a much more simple approach. Again, it could be a church group. It could be a lodge. It could be a barber shop. I just need someone to get it started and someone to continue to give it life. Um, I grew up, I say, because I was there for so long, at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And uh, one of the things they had there was an initiative called Healthiest Maryland. And uh, it was not specific to diabetes, I want to be clear to that, but it's certainly an approach that included diabetes. And uh, it was to encourage system change rather than to just um, do education. And again, it was a, an effort where they worked with businesses, businesses and schools and communities, and uh, they rolled out the initiative through the local health department so that it was a very local approach to the issues. Um, they worked with the participant groups so that they learned the benefits of improving health and nutrition opportunities for their employees or students uh, and their neighbors. Then about four years ago, uh, again, the Maryland Department of Health used a social approach for their own employees with diabetes. Uh, one of the educators uh, got together a group of employees with diabetes and formed a lunch bunch. And uh, the lunch bunch met about every two weeks um, at lunchtime in one of the conference rooms. And it started with the educator who, you know, taught them some of the things they needed to know. And then as it evolved, the educator, I'm sorry, I have hair in my mouth. <laughs> um, the educator uh, was able to move out of the picture. Um, she was invited back as they felt they needed her for something. But uh, it became their group. They took it over and they continued to, um, to operate it. Uh, the one time I stopped in to visit it, uh, they were discussing family members and family support. And um, they were talking about family members who supported them with a lecturing approach. <laughs> you know, you're not eating what you should, you're not getting enough sleep, blah, blah, blah. And how that made them feel and what could they do to deal with it. So um, it, was, it was really meeting the needs of the group. But what if you're not a group person? Um, my husband, he would rather die than go to a doctor. He'd rather die than join a group. Um, you probably will because of it. But nevertheless, um, there are opportunities out there in the social arena for people who are not group people. They can do it anonymously. And uh, we do it now with our so social media sites, with our blogs. Um, there is one diabetes um, site, I think it's called Diabetic Connect, it actually has 150,000 members. And that's a great way you can learn, you can ask questions, you can talk, and you don't ever have to look at another human being <laughs> if that's a problem for you. So social marketing and social media have a lot of potential. They, they provide new opportunities for us. Um, I truly delete, do believe that they can be cost effective, but cost effective doesn't mean free, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, we still need those preventive monies to get this approach moving and uh, to keep, you know, in order to have people to, to keep it alive, to keep it going. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I want to thank all, all of these women for being available earlier today and on this panel. And I, I want you to know that I did not set out to fill the room with powerful and brilliant women, but I have done it, so let's <laughs> give them a hand. Um, I also would like to say that I invited for this panel, I, I really wanted to have a broad range of opinion. Um, I was hoping for some representation from the food, beverage, or restaurant industry. Uh, I invited each of those industries to provide a speaker, and they all declined for various reasons that, you know, Primarily, they said, we're sorry, we don't have anyone available right then. Um, so that's why we have the panel that we have, and I appreciate their uh, being here. So let me, if, if any of you have questions, please step up to the mic, and I'm going to just prime the pump quickly by, by asking, um, uh, maybe drop a, a bomb in the room, soda tax. Effective, politically possible, worth doing, any thoughts from anybody? The eyes are looking my way. Um, and if, if, if you need her to speak up, please let us know. There's a mic here that is a room mic if, okay. you, if you need it. Um, so we do advocate for a soda tax, and a number of cities and states are, are looking at it. Um, 
there's good evidence to show that taxes work to reduce consumption. With soft drinks right now, the majority of states actually do already tax soft drinks, but the taxes are so small that they're not having an impact on consumption. So if you say, do the current soda taxes impact consumption? No, they don't, but they're very tiny. And so you wouldn't expect them to. But if the taxes increase to say, you know, eight to 10%, they would have an effect um, and reduce consumption of soft drinks. Soft drinks are the number one source of calories in Americans' diets. So people are getting more calories from sugary beverages than anything else, than bread, french fries, hamburgers, um, anything else. So they're a big source of calories. They're the only individual food that's been directly linked to obesity in multiple studies. So it's clearly something we need to do something about. And at the same time, we can raise money for public health and the kinds of things that you know other people on the panel talked about. I mean, you can raise money for um, for more PE, for healthier school lunches, for you know, addressing other public health and prevention needs. So politically, they're not easy to pass, but I think just like tobacco taxes, if you looked at those, you know, 10 years ago, you'd see that they were hard to pass. So we're kind of at the beginning of the soda tax movement, and I think you'll see it gaining speed over the years. Any other thoughts on that? No one else wants to CDC touch it. want to take an official position? <laughs> Not able to. <laughs> Glad you're able to speak. She up. loves her job. She's going to. Gonna... <laughs> okay. Um, my question. I mean, you're sort of a natural for the the answer, but I'd like to hear you know from everybody on this. Um, the tobacco labeling, nobody talked about, and. I mean, that's really in there with diabetes. And I, I don't know whether this all goes to the lung people, so you don't talk about it. But, you know, when I see the my television in New York, I see plaque with, you know, those scare commercials and, and diabetes, and they're talking about that. And now the tobacco industry is suing the FDA, am I correct, about this? About whether it's freedom of speech and whether they can do that. So one, I'm interested in what you guys think about that, you know, where that's headed. And, you know, the other thing is, as a reporter who, at least for a while, seemed to be on the SALT Institute's list, <laughs> I mean, I was really getting some trash from them for a long time about, you know, they were singing the praises of this kind of shallow piece in a major scientific magazine that, the salt industry is, you know, I mean, the salt, the battle on salt is over. Um, I guess I'm just, you know, in New York, you see it one way. We're, we're like the extreme left, it seems like, in the country on, on this kind of stuff. Um, I'm just wondering where you think this stuff is headed with food labeling as well and, and the tobacco. I'll make a few comments. I think we all probably can sort of comment from different perspectives. Um, uh, certainly, CDC has been working with the FDA on some of these, uh, and our, my agency director, Dr. Frieden, is uh, from New York, um, uh, supports this sort of these images for tobacco. You asked a question earlier today about from the panels of people with diabetes. Um, the evidence and the investigation of using those kinds of images for motivating people. In diabetes, it's a real mixed bag because you can quit tobacco. You can't quit diabetes. And so it, it makes a difference because if you can give up this, yes, you can modify your eating habits, you can modify your uh, lifestyle habits in diabetes, but you don't get to quit the disease. And so it's important in diabetes that you need to factually tell people about the complications. You need to be sure they do understand that. But then you have to give them hope and optimism for how to, to diminish those, those consequences and what you can do. So you got you to gotta give the one-two. You can't just say, yes, let me march you up to the dialysis unit and parade all these people in front of you. Because for a lot of people, that's the last thing they need. They stick their head in the sand and then they just shut down because they, they feel hopeless and they feel helpless. And certainly for some of our, 
um, high-risk ethnic populations, they have this sense that it's inevitable. And so if you put those images even more in front of them, it's even harder for them. So I think in diabetes, you've got to be sure that you've got the one, two. You're going to factually help sure they make sure they understand this, but you've got to give them optimistic and positive messages to how they can help to forego those or to minimize their likelihood. In the sodium issue, also an issue my agency is very uh, much focused on these days. Um, I think for both the, the images on tobacco, we're learning a lot from the tobacco um, efforts. Realize the tobacco efforts were multi-pronged. They, they're looking at both getting regulations passed on, on indoor air. They uh, looked at taxation policies or pricing strategies, we call them. Um, they also have looked at getting people better access to meds or tobacco quit lines, all of those things, it's a package deal. So they didn't just go after, you know, bad images on the tobacco. That's actually fairly new in the U.S. It was happening in Europe quite a bit. So I think you have to think of them as a package deal. In the diabetes world, I'd say it's a similar thing. And in the sodium world, we're learning a lot these days. I think there's still some mixed evidence. Um, most of the sodium that people take in is found in food processed foods or in foods, it's not found by adding salt to the table. So it may be one of those strategies where working with food manufacturers to amend some of the sodium content. My sister happens to be a food scientist, and she just got asked to consult on a project in which she's now working with the Culinary Institute to try to look at how can people prepare foods more effectively, how can manufacturers prepare food more effectively without such extensive use of sodium. So again, the chance to bring science to the table. What are the sensory scientists able to do to help offer solutions to these manufacturers, and how do we help people, again, make the healthy choice the easier choice for them to get so that there are more food options with less sodium added. So lots to learn still in the sodium front, but certainly one that's, that does show a contribution to hypertension and some of the other things going on. But again, multifaceted problems. I don't know if other people want to comment on sodium or horrible images on tobacco. Um, well, I was just curious. I'm, um, do you, can you anybody comment if the food industry is working on any you know, good substitutes for a lot of the, sh the sugar substitutes? I mean, if you're saying that you know, um, people need the better alternatives, there are a lot of people out there who are diabetic who just, you know, like I had an aunt who wouldn't go near anything that wasn't you know, sugar laden because her feeling was is that nothing could taste as good as sugar. So I mean, what, uh, when you're looking for a sugar high and that, you know, you want that chocolate mousse, as, as a reporter, how can I cover it that these are other options that could give you that same, that can fulfill that same craving? Well, the, the, again, it could be because of living or spending a part of my growing up time and talking to my sister as a sensory scientist. And, and having worked in the obesity lab at UC Davis, I did my postdoc in, in obesity and nutrition. And um, it, sensory science is a real deal with food. You know, it, I mean, we we think about food, we celebrate with food, we we have a lot of we have a very personal relationship with food, and so it it really has a lot of social connections for us. And so, yeah, probably a lot of it is people have have good memories and good experiences uh, with food, and so there are a lot of things associated with that that can make it difficult to make some of these connections. When I was seeing patients individually and helping coach them with their nutrition changes, one of the first things I would ask people is, if you opened, uh, pick your favorite candy or your favorite sweet item, if you open the bag of it, if you open the chocolate mousse, can you take a few bites of it and put the rest away? Or once you start it, forget it. The whole thing is going to be gone. And so you have to strategize with people based on what their particular issues are. So what happened in my family, this is how I grew up, is instead of making a lot of sugar-free items, We'd have some of those, but we, my mom would make smaller portions of stuff. You can look at now at the 100 calorie snacks that are out there. It's that whole principle. Maybe you can eat a smaller amount. If somebody asked the panelists today, how many of you eat you know, hamburgers or, or foods that's not so great for you? I think having those smaller portion sizes available and making, again, it easier for people. Now, of course, they have to be financially viable for people, but it's a strategy. You try to maybe still eat the yummy stuff that you like, but you try to, to 
work yourself down to smaller amounts, maybe having it less frequently. And if you use medications, then you've got to make adjustments in your medications to account for it. So there are multiple strategies, and they work differently for different people. I wish there were a magic answer. Yeah, here's a perfect product. It, it doesn't have anything in it that could potentially be um, problem for you, but that's not going to be the same for everybody. There are some people who do have issues with artificial sweeteners. Many people do not. Um, and so I think, again, there are multiple answers because there are multiple appetites, there are multiple sensory issues, there are multiple food barriers that people have. Just to add, um, you know, our food environment is so messed up. It, it's just, it's so out of balance with health. There are, you know, about I think we're up to about 3,800 calories available per person per day, which is you know almost twice as much as people need. And there is there's constant um, reminders and um, like prodding marketing availability that cause us to want to eat, you know, again and again and again, and usually the wrong kinds of foods. And so with sweets, I think it is hard to know how much people really like them and how much they're just conditioned to want to eat them through all the marketing, through all the availability, and that, you know, we're just ha kind of habituated. You know, there, there are people who are looking at food addiction, and I think it's, it's interesting, but still kind of a new... Um, area that where there's not quite enough science but I think people certainly are habituated to certain kinds of eating habits and some things like sweets you know we just get used to having them and as you get used to having them you don't only want to have them you know each time you want to have more of them so you look at like you know it's not enough to just have a little candy bar I wouldn't I was in China several years ago I was so thrilled at how tiny the little Snickers candy bars were you know, and it wasn't quite the snack size, but it was a reasonable size as opposed to our big one that we have here, which is supposedly three servings, but nobody's, you know, cutting up with a knife. And so then you get, you know, candies are big, ice creams are big, soft drinks are big, and people are getting so much of this food at so many different meals. You know, it's not just dessert. It's donuts at breakfast and soft drinks for lunch and dessert later in the day that it's just it's become so much the norm here. And I think we need to find ways to help people break those habits and form better eating habits. I mean, I talked a lot about kids because in some ways it's easier to start from the beginning and food marketing is so important. The billions of dollars that companies spend help to shape the whole way kids think about food, what they expect to be fed. They expect to have candy for breakfast cookie crisp cereal, Reese's puff cereal. I mean, these sugary breakfast cereals that are marketed to kids are candy, basically, with some vitamins sprayed on them. And the companies are out there doing studies and trying to convince all of you in the public that cereal is such a healthy choice. Um, and so kids, you know, grew up thinking that they should be eating hamburgers and french fries and all the foods that they see marketed to them all the time. So, you know, whereas if we grew up thinking fruit was sweet and that that was enough of a treat, we would just eat fruit for dessert and be happy as they do in, you know, many other countries. So I think, there, you know, so much of it is our environment and what it's evolved to that people expect and have become accustomed to eating this crap, you know, all the time. Did you have a question? I do. Um, did I interrupt a panelist first? No. I, I was just going to make a, 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 oh, re a really small comment um, to tie on to that, just as our experience at the American Diabetes Association. And I'll tell it to you from a, a, a frustration to me as we have things on our website, on our homepage, and I'm always trying to get the advocacy and call your member of Congress and get funding for this. And there's always these recipes on there. It's like, what? Can we put on my big advocacy issue? But, but I think that goes to, to what the, we were talking about, is that the people with diabetes who are our constituents and our members are very interested in having those options. I mean, there was just an article in Diabetes Forecast about the little desserts yeah. and how you can do it and how you can sort of find moderation because given telling people that no is the only option doesn't 
work. And so we really find people are very interested in the cookbooks and the recipes in finding a way around um, without just having to say, I'm going to eat salad with balsamic vinegar for the rest of my life. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see that amongst the folks that, that work with our association. And there are more sugar substitutes, as you were asking, on the market than there used to be. That, um, you know, I mean, some people like the taste of some of the sugar substitutes that are out there, and some people don't. But there are a lot of different ones to choose from that work in different kinds of food applications. And some of them, the safety is, I think, somewhat questionable, and others, like sucralose, are totally fine. I want to talk about, um, I want to have you, rather, talk about uh, the economics behind all of this. We all know uh, that many of the populations at risk for developing diabetes in, in the children and in the adults, um, a lot of them can't afford to join the, the gym. Oh. <laughs> That's a, it's, a, it's a lovely voice, though. We're at the spa. I was like, ah. Uh, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, join, joining a gym is, is economically out of reach for a number of the populations who most need that. Um, a number of these populations that we're talking about, particularly minority communities, are food deserts. Um, can you talk about what might be on the horizon, perhaps even various legislatures through the country that, that could be addressing these issues as far as making exercise you know, more, more affordable? I know everybody can just do push-ups at home, but for those of us who need a shower after we do that, or um, places to buy food that, that is filling and nourishing, but isn't as expensive as whole paycheck. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll start with a few few things. Um, in point of fact, the community transformation grants that were just released today are intended to help with that. Um, they are intended to help change some of the environmental influences on nutrition, physical activity, obesity, and tobacco control. So they, they are indeed in, intending to do that. So uh, as you hear more about who was funded and what they're doing specifically in their communities, what geographic area they're covering, the kinds of things that they're putting in place, that will give you some, some other very specific ideas. Um, they were in, asked to follow some strategies. We refer to them as MEP strategies. It's just an acronym. It, it really is, again, looking at the evidence, and it's one of the things that we do at CDC is really to try to put out some of those best or effective practices. But again, let me just say, effective practices, you have to think of the context. So something that you may do as an individual would not necessarily be something that you're just going to replicate in a community. There may be other things that have to be done, and it may work in the Mississippi Delta, might not work in Denver, Colorado. So you've got to think about what are the sort of the, the assets that are in the community, what assets do you already have there? Who can you get to come on board? And that's really at the heart of those grants. They had to really get their communities organized and working together, not just this public health department, not just one group. But that was a major feature in that grant, is how many people and, and in what meaningful ways could you organize them together, because these are going to take more than that. Let me also mention something going on in the American Indian community. Our um, team at CDC, we have a native diabetes wellness program. And one of the things that we have done is provided funding to various tribes to do what's really called uh, returning to, to native foods. And so they are doing things like school gardens, they are using um, hydro technology now to actually be able to return to native foods and to actually utilize those and to grow those and to access those in their communities, many of which are food deserts. And so they really are looking at ways to not only make it financially achievable, but something that's sustainable. So they're also working with um, farmers markets. They're using, um, you know, almost it's, it's like a WIC coupon or a food stamp sort of a 
the situation to be able to use those at those farmers markets. So it's trying to deal with that economic issue as well as that access issue. So there are a, a couple of examples of the kinds of things that are going on to make food more accessible and to change the offerings at these locations, but to make it financially viable because many times, you know, these um, companies or, or um, businesses that are in these communities have been unable to sustain their contribution in those communities for a variety of problems. And so it's why you've got to get the, the you know, law enforcement involved, you've got to get a whole lot of housing authority involved, you've got to get a lot of these non-health people. There's another statement we use in public health, health in all policies. So let's think about those transportation policies. How do you lay out communities and build the roads? How do you make walking and bike paths more available to people so that they're safe? You'd be amazed at some of the photographs that have been taken in communities that are so inaccessible to physical activity. So they're really trying to build the communities in a more constructive way. Again, those are all pieces that are, are found in these new community transformation grants. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, an, another set of grants that recently came out are, are the Medicaid Incentive for Prevention of Chronic Disease grants and those also coming out of the Affordable Care Act. So I wanted to, going particularly to looking at the Medicaid population and a number of those were focused on diabetes and, and the national diet and the diabetes prevention program model that, that we've talked about so many times today. So I, I think that that's another place that we can see some focusing on the Medicaid population. And, but I think that what you said was, was just so true. We put people live in places where there's nowhere to safely exercise and they're living in food deserts and there are only fast food restaurants. You know, and, and you put those together and you haven't set up a healthy living structure. I do think that, that part of the First Lady's initiative is looking at that and trying, I mean, to, to sit there at the, at when Let's Move was announced and hear the word food deserts finally recognized at the highest levels of government was really a breath of fresh air because it was as if they didn't exist before that. Um, I do think there's some mistakes being made in this area um, and, and one is um, in the area of workplace wellness. Um, a part of the Affordable Care Act um, that we didn't support is that currently um, you can basically tie someone's premiums into workplace wellness. So that's all well and good um, if it's participation and people have a chance to participate. In other words, it's not a low-wage job that you can't take the time to participate in because you have to get on to your other two or three low-paid paid jobs. Um, where they become the most noxious is that, unfortunately, there was an expansion of workplace wellness that, that is tied to premiums and also to health outcomes. So if you don't lose weight, you will have to pay more for your premiums, which to me completely ignores people who live in places where there aren't, there isn't access to exercise, there isn't time to exercise because of the economic circumstances, and there aren't food deserts. So we, we need to incentivize people to be involved in workplace wellness and other things. We have to do it in a way that, that includes everybody in our community and not people who you know, can go to whole, pay, whole paycheck, as you mentioned. So I think there's some mistakes we're making, but also some really good progress we are in realizing that the population that, that is most impacted by chronic disease needs to have special focus and special grant programs really thinking about what impacts those areas. I think, too, it's one of the reasons why looking at nutrition, physical activity, and obesity, and, you know, which are so important to diabetes prevention in an in a policy and environmental way, as opposed to in the past, you know, it seemed like 10 years ago, the strategy for helping people eat better was just to like wag your finger at them and say, you know, eat less, move more, which, you know, doesn't work at all for, for most people. Um, I don't think it works for probably anyone. So looking at policies are a way to help all communities have access to healthy foods and more access to physical activity. So programs like Safe Routes to School, making it safe for children to walk and bike. 
transportation policies that make it possible for people to walk and bike safely in their communities. Healthier food in schools, which is especially important for low-income families whose kids rely on the school lunch and breakfast program, after-school programs, making sure that there's physical activity and healthy snacks, child care. You know, some states are working on policies to make it um, to make more physical activity available in child care and to make sure that healthy foods are available. But that's important because one in five kids are already overweight by the time they get to kindergarten. And so making sure that there's nutrition and physical activity and less screen time in child care facilities is really important. But most states are not doing very well in that area. Breastfeeding promotion, which is important for nutrition, but also for obesity prevention, you know, making sure that their hospitals have supportive policies. You know, most women start breastfeeding, but many of them stop before they even leave the hospital because there isn't the kind of support they need to keep breastfeeding and there's all this free formula given away and marketing to them in the hospital. So looking at nutrition and physical activity in a comprehensive um, way in ways that create supportive communities where you know all communities have an easier time of getting healthy food, eating healthy food, being more physically active. I think as opposed to the past where this idea that it was all a matter of personal responsibility and yeah, personal responsibility is a part of it, but if you don't have healthy food in your community, how can you exercise that responsibility? Or as a parent, you know, I can try to be a responsible parent, but if I send my kid to school with lunch money and they can buy a Coke and a candy bar out of a vending machine, you know, what can I do about it? So I think looking at nutrition and physical activity in a more comprehensive community way and a policy way helps low-income communities in particular, but it helps everybody. Dr. Albright, you mentioned um, before about um, that we, we know that diabetics aren't going to be respond aren't going to respond well to being marched through a kidney dialysis unit. They're going to kind of shut down and just not. Many of them. Many will. of them will. So, is is there a certain psychology to to living with and? Beating diabetes, like they're like you know, a, a lot of scientists and clinicians have painted with cancer and um, with other chronic diseases. That's a great question. Um, I, it's funny that you would, I, you'd be the one, I would be asked that question because I, I absolutely believe there is a philosophy about living with a chronic disease. Um, I was very fortunate as a child that my mom really helped me develop that philosophy, and it. And really, it was, in a, in a nutshell, sort of two things. Do all you can, and the rest of it's out of your control. And the other was be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. And I firmly believe getting engaged, participating, it not only helps you cope with your diabetes because you're doing something. There's very much something about having diabetes that feels like something's been taken away from you. Control has been taken away from you because you're spending all of your time trying to control something. And it's almost like you've got your hands on a tornado and you're sort of stuck at this thing and you're trying to wield this thing around you. And so by doing those things that help you cope and, and engage. So yes, you've got to learn about your diabetes. Yes, you need to help your family members understand it and support you. But I think for you personally, it is understanding that perfection isn't the goal. If it were, we'd have cured the disease. But that can't be the goal. But let me just do the best I can, and the rest of it is not within my control. And if you can engage, that's why I certainly have become, and I'm an active volunteer for ADA. I've worked for other and participated, volunteered in other diabetes-related organizations. I think that's probably a philosophy for a lot of people, even beyond diabetes. If you can give in and get, get involved and give back, you gain way more than you're ever able to give. And I think that goes a long way in helping people cope because you can feel like you're doing something positive and you're really giving back. So those would probably be my, my tidbits of philosophy that I think are really helpful. Yeah, it's certainly having a positive attitude about, you know, that certainly comes up in cancer, be sort of not going to be, you know, overtaken by the disease. I think in diabetes that may be even more important for people um, to have that kind of attitude is not, not to be overcome by it. Other questions? End of the day? Okay, well, I want to 
give thank you certificates to the two of our speakers who haven't yet received them. Oh, so you can go ahead. Our book can be book can be fine. See how smooth that was? <laughs> Arlene Stevenson. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much. Can we have please one more round of applause for this fabulous? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.